Video two of this week, we're talking about progressivism, specifically Teddy Roosevelt progress progressivism. La la la. The election of 1900 between uh, current president uh, William McKinley and William Jennings Bryant, who's still trying to become president, it's still not working out for him. So on the one side, we have the Republicans. Led, uh, led the country through the war, acquired territories, the gold standard, and of course, Vice President Teddy Roosevelt, who he's going to draw a lot of votes because he's very charismatic. And then on the other side, the Democrats nominee, anti-imperialist, and the silver standard, and you see uh, the vote. We've got Texas votes blue and California votes red because, I mean, it is crazy, crazy world. All right, and everything's great and everything's groovy and... People aren't saying the word groovy yet because that's the 1960s, and then we get, oh, all right. So in September 6, 1901, so President McKinley has been in office now, not, well, he's been in office for four years, but in his second term, he hasn't been in office very long, and he is going to be assassinated. So the short version here, like I ever have a short version, let's pretend I have a short version for this. In Buffalo, New York, we, they have the Pan-American Exposition. And so uh, President McKinley is going to go up there and shake hands. He's a big handshaker. He doesn't have any problem shaking people's hands. Now, he's told a couple of times, no, you probably shouldn't do this because, you know, there's crazy people out there. And he's like, nah, don't worry about it. And this is really before the Secret Service was the Secret Service. Um, and so his, uh, his chief of staff and people were saying, can we at least have, you know, like army people standing around just to kind of be there? And he kind of agreed to that. Well, in, a, in one of the big buildings there at the exposition, the music, the music room, the music house, the music, anyway, someplace uh, there in Buffalo, New York, he, uh, he's standing there and the plan is to open the door for 10 minutes and whoever files in, he's going to shake their hands. McKinley was known as the hand shaker and, and uh, according to various sources, he could shake 50, 5 zero, 50 hands per minute. That's, that's pretty fast if you think about, you know, I mean, that's handshake, handshake, handshake. And while he does that, the, uh, the, the stories say that he would reach out and pull the person away from him to get to the next person in line. So there you go. So he's blowing through people's handshakes, and uh, the stories say that, oh, I'm laughing, but this is an assassination. Uh, the stories say that um, the assassin came up. Uh, the guy in front of the assassin, the stories say that uh, he was uh, pretty tall and scruffy looking, and everybody was kind of focused on him. And then when he got to the front of the line, nothing happened because he was an assassin. But then the assassin was behind him, and the assassin uh, stepped up. Now, here's the deal. Most of the time, when you go up and you talk to the president, uh, your hands are empty. They're not in your pockets. They're not being covered. But because it, it was kind of hot inside the house, or inside that room, people had their handkerchiefs out. And so people were dabbing their foreheads and everything. Well, this, the assassin, he had a handkerchief covering his shooting hand and the gun. So when he approached the president, nobody was really thinking about it because everybody had handkerchief dab, dab and sweat off their forehead. So he's going to come up to the president. The president is going to extend his hand out, and the assassin is going to shoot him twice. He's going to shoot him twice. One, the, one of the bullets is going to hit a steel button, and it's going to kind of graze, graze the president, and they're going to find that bullet later kind of in his pocket. The second bullet is going to go uh, through his abdomen, and it's going to perforate a whole bunch of organs. Um, so, yuck. I've been I've been intentionally not trying to tell you the name of the uh, assassin because it's very hard to say. So here it is. Uh, he's an anarchist. Uh, his name is Leon Shogost. Chirgos Zogosh. Hey, the reason I pronounce it three different ways is because YouTube has no idea how to pronounce it either. I I, I typed in how do you pronounce this guy's last name, and. I clicked on three different <laughs> three different videos, and each time they gave me a different way of pronouncing it. Anyway, that guy C Z C Z O L O G S Z 
however you want to pronounce it, he's the assassin. He wasn't very happy because he lost his job in 1893 because of the panic, and then he blamed the man, who wasn't actually the man because he wasn't president yet, but then when he became president, he became the man, and so he's going to shoot the man, and he did shoot the man. Uh, McKinley is going to be uh, rushed up. Uh, Leon's going to get tackled, and he's going to get beaten up. And ultimately, uh, I mean, he's not going to escape at all. They're going to uh, sentence him to death. He's going to get the electric chair uh, in a couple of weeks after this. Uh, so he's going to be executed. The president is going to live for another six days, six or seven days, uh, and uh, they're not going to be able to find the bullet. The problem with these kind of injuries is that the bullet you know, goes through, and then you develop uh, gangrene and sepsis, and there's not really a cure back then for that kind of stuff. So they had to get the bullet out, but they couldn't find the bullet. Now, of course, the, one of the anecdotal stories here, one of these ironic things, is that for this particular Pan Exposition in 18, I'm sorry, 1901, they were introducing to the world the newfangled X-ray machine. So there, there has been suggestion in hindsight from historians and people who like to say, hey, what if, what if they had put the president, if they had walked him down the street to the new fangled x-ray machine and put him, you know, under the x-ray, they would have been able to find the bullet because, you know, bullet, metal, x-ray machine. But nobody thought that all the way through. And so um, the, president is gonna, the president is going to retire uh, back to, uh, he's going to go to the hospital, and he's going to make a, a, what it looks like a, a recovery, and then you know, the gangrene's going to get him. So he's going to pass away, and Teddy Roosevelt, the vice president Teddy Roosevelt, becomes president. Now, in 1906, so five years later, Congress finally makes it official that the Secret Service, which was just a part of the Treasury, well, technically, they're still part of the Treasury today. But um, the Secret Service, uh, which at that point, their main their main jurisdiction was basically uh, counterfeit money. Now they're in charge of counterfeit money and the protection of the president. So there you go, starting in 1906. Because it only took three presidents to be assassinated for them to figure that out. Speaking of presidential assassinations, just for fun, well, it's not really fun, it's kind of awful, but... Um, in the 1930s, a reporter was doing some research. He was probably listening to his AP U.S. history teacher or his U.S. history teacher and was saying, hey, you know, that's kind of interesting because look at the dates of the presidents who have died. And so here you go. Uh, and so we call this, we call this the curse of Tippecanoe. The reason we call it the curse of Tippecanoe because it was uh, originally started with William Henry Harrison. All right, you ready? Here we go. Hold on to your hats. In 1840, William Henry Harrison was elected as president. He died because of pneumonia, because he was out in the rain giving a speech. 20 years later, in 1860, President Lincoln was elected. He was assassinated during his tenure. In 1880, 20 years later, Garfield, President Garfield was elected. He was assassinated in his tenure. 20 years later, McKinley was elected in 1900. He was assassinated during his, during his presidential year. 20 years later, in 1920, Harding was elected. He died uh, in, as president, uh, cerebral hemorrhage. 20 years later, 1940, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was elected. He died, complications of polio. 20 years later, 1960, JFK is going to be assassinated during his election, right? So you've been paying attention, you've been doing the math. Every 20 years, every 20 years, 1840, 1860, 1880, 1900, 1920, 1940, 1960, they call it the curse of Tippecanoe. 1980, President Reagan. President Reagan's going to be shot and uh, hurt uh, pretty bad uh, in 1981, I think, uh, by William Hink Hinckley Jr., a almost assassination, but he survives. And so Reagan breaks the curse. For, for that. 20 years later, so that was 20 years after JFK. 20 years after Reagan was George W. became president. 
There, there were some assassination attempts on, on the president. None of them got close. The closest thing to George W. was somebody threw a shoe at him at, at a press conference, and he, he dodged. You should look that up on YouTube. Um, and so he survived all of his assassination attempts. All, like I said, none, none got close. And then 20 years after that, who's the new president? Oh, elected in 2020, Joe Biden. Okay, so there you go. I spent way too much time on this slide. Uh, please note, some of you are like, wait, 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 wait. The president elected in 1848, Zachary Taylor. He died in office in 1848. That wasn't a, a year of 20 rule. That was just a 1848. And remember, he died because he had some bad milk uh, stomach issue and he passed away. Yeah, I know it's not perfect, but it is interesting that 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. All right. Teddy Roosevelt becomes president. Is this thing on? Oh, there for a second I thought, oh, I did that whole thing and I'm not even recording. Oh, whew. that was, I would hate to have to do that again. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy is the youngest president, youngest person to be president. He's not the youngest president to be elected, but he is the youngest president to be president because he was vice president. Uh, was known for his abrasive attitude towards cowards obstacles and anything not manly. Teddy Roosevelt, he was mm, manly. <laughs> we'll, we'll do some stories here in a second. The ultimate loose constructionist. Okay, remember loose construction, strict construction. Loose construction, it's not written down, so therefore it's okay. Loose construction. This guy, loose construction, and he is going to, he's going to run with that. Uh, push for outdoors legislation in national parks, concentrate a lot of effort in Central America, uh, Panama Canal, and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906 for negotiating the Russian-Japanese uh, peace treaty. All right, so let's talk about him a little bit. Uh, President Roosevelt was very, was very divisive. Among, I mean, uh, polarizing, that's the word I'm looking for. You either liked him or you didn't like him. Uh, goodness, if this guy had had Twitter, <laughs> in fact, a lot of people compare Teddy Roosevelt and his abrasive attitude to our former president and uh, his abrasive attitude. So let's see. Teddy Roosevelt fam famously said, walk softly, walk softly, but carry a big stick. Yeah, I think that all the way through. Walk softly, but carry a big stick. He's talking about diplomacy. Uh, as his critics see him, there's Teddy Roosevelt with his his lariat and his six-shooter, and he's riding the world, because go Teddy, right? And then here we have uh, him walking softly and, and with his big stick, and he's basically controlling, uh, he's protecting the Car uh, Caribbean Sea there uh, with, with the U.S. Uh, Navy. So a lot of people, a lot of people uh, not big fans of Teddy, but a lot of people were big fans of Teddy. In fact, uh, well, there you go. There's only four guys on Mount Rushmore, yeah? There's, can I do this? I can't I barely see it. Washington, and then the, oh, I have to look at that. Okay, okay, Washington, Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Lincoln. So, I mean, he's one of the big four. Well, on the mountain, anyway. Panama Canal. So the Panama Canal, Obviously, you know, you learn this in world history. To go all the way around the, the Cape, oof, that's a long, a long, long way to go. So if we can just cut through, if we can cut through uh, the middle part then, uh, you know, in uh, Central America, then it's going to save time, it's going to save money uh, on, on uh, commercial businesses. So the first plan was maybe we could go through Nicaragua and because there's lots of uh, lakes and things in Nicaragua, and even you can kind of go through there. And then somebody, and then Nicaragua said, "No." And the French got involved in this, and the French started started to uh, uh, clear cut some forests and started to blow up some stuff. And with regard to to mountains, and then they got hit by yellow fever, and then they ran out of money, and then people are like, "Why are we even doing this?" And so then ultimately Roosevelt's going to get involved. And he's going to go talk to Panama. And uh, <laughs> uh, so Panama was a state of Colombia. 
so think about your world history map, Colombia, which is the n north part of South America, and then that little bitty hook is Panama. Panama was part of Colombia. And so uh, President Roosevelt, he may have, he may have, um, how do we say this, uh, stolen Panama away from Colombia. And here's how you do it. You go up to the Colombian officials and you say, hey guys, if you, if you claim that you're independent from Colombia, United States of America, we will recognize you. And once we recognize you, who's going to tell Colombia that you're not a country because if Colombia's like, oh, you can't do that, then we're the United States of America, walks off and carry a big stick. So that's what Panama did. They declared their independence. Roosevelt immediately recognized uh, Panamanian independence. And just a couple of days later, Panama granted the United States of America the rights to cut a channel right th through their country. Huh. Columbia couldn't do anything about it. So, uh, we're going to... Uh, <laughs> this was seen as a negative event in the ideas of Latin American-U.S. relations. <laughs> really? Um, so we are going to then spend a lot of money and a lot of manpower um, going down there and cutting a big canal through the Panama Canal. A lot of cool facts about the Panama Canal, but I spent way too much time on the previous slides, so... Uh, go look up how much it costs to swim the Panama Canal, because you can do that if you're willing to pay the charges. All right. Uh, but anyway, it costs uh, $8.8 .8 billion if we're talking about two twenty seventeen dollars So a lot of money. All right, moving on. We signed a contract with Panama that said that we would be in charge of the Panama Canal up to the year 2000 and uh, that we would, you know, we would make all the money from it because people, are, you know, we're charging money and the people are paying money. So we're going to make money off that. And then we did. We gave it back. So Panama owns it now. And so the United States, we now have to pay money to go through, the, through our own canal that we built. Mondra, the Monroe Doctrine, as a reminder, the Monroe Doctrine says, hey, Europe, stay out of our business. We got this on our side. Stay out. That's the Monroe Doctrine. Then we have what's known as the, the, coral, the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. So a corollary is an addition to or a tweak of the language. So the corollary, excuse me, the corollary basically says... Nobody can mess with Latin America except us. That's the corollary. The, the except us part, that's the corollary. Nobody can mess with Latin America. Nobody can get in Latin America's business. Well, I mean, we can, but nobody else can. Uh, and so we call that the Roosevelt Corollary. And so here you have a political cartoon of uh, President Roosevelt um, using diplomacy, perhaps, um, with regard to... Right. The joke in there says, uh, Roosevelt feared Latin American countries, and then, then it says, no, that's not true, because Roosevelt, uh, manly, he doesn't fear anything. The story says that uh, he wasn't even afraid of death. In fact, death was afraid of him. And so, ultimately, when Teddy Roosevelt died, he died in his sleep because death was afraid to sneak up on him when he was alive. Okay. Shattig is playing music way... I'll be right back. Shattig, what are you doing? Okay. I was wrong. That wasn't Shattig, although we can blame him anyway. That's your art teacher. walking around the building with a karaoke machine singing Neil Diamond. That's how crazy this place is starting to get. We're all starting to lose our marbles and our minds.
can't even make that stuff up. Oh, he's coming back. No, he's not. All right. Japan. Uh, all right, so Japan. Uh, let's see. Ended its self-imposed ban on immigration in 1884. If you recall from world history last year, Japan basically said, nope, we're not, we're not playing with the rest of the world. We are going to be our own little people. And, of course, if you remember, uh, then the United States showed up with, uh, with the gunboats and says, you're going to open up your ports to us. And then there you go. But they had an immigration ban of, the, of their own, but they're going to they're release that in 1884. And so thousands of Japanese are going to come over here to California. And surprise, surprise, California is going to start passing anti-immigrant Japanese immigration laws. And we're going to start, uh, yeah, going after the Japanese through just ticky-tack stuff. Racial segregation laws were passed, causing Japan to threaten war. Oof. I wonder if that's ever going to come back on us later. Let's see. Japan declaring war. Huh. Nah. Let's see. Roosevelt convinced California to repeal the laws. So uh, I like this picture. So here's President Roosevelt, and he's... Uh, he's taking his hat off and he's talking to the little boy. The little boy represents California. And so he says, for heaven's sake, do not embarrass the administration. So he's, he's, he's smacking around California there. And you see the Japanese, the Japanese uh, mom, the Japanese kid, and schoolyard in San Francisco. So apparently uh, the little boy was, was uh, bullying the, the little Japanese kid. And Roosevelt's like, stop, don't bully people. Uh, agreed to stop immigrating, uh, let's see, Roosevelt convinced California to repeal the laws in Japan, agreed to stop immigrating, oh, this should be an E instead of an I, awkward, to California, and this was known as the Gentleman's Agreement. Okay, progressive, progressive platform, so the progressive platform in the early 1900s, it boils down to this, improve human welfare, fight monopolies. Get rid of corruption, remove government inefficiency, and champion social injustice. That all seems pretty decent things to do. So we're, here we have uh, another, another political cartoon, President Roosevelt, and he's uh, shooting, <laughs> he's shooting uh, the bad trusts, and he's got the good trusts under, uh, we'll talk about it in a second. All right. Let's get to muckraking first. So muckraking, it's a, a term that uh, basically means uh, the journalists out there who are trying to uh, throw dirt onto the administration. So the muck rakers, they're raking the muck, raking the dirt, raking the mud, uh, and trying to throw it onto the president and or the administration. So that term was basically, basically coined by President Roosevelt and he's gonna have to deal with this. And probably really at that point from here on out, right, uh, the presidents ha have to deal with the muck rakers. Some more so than others, but uh, there you go. So uh, the muck rakers are going to accuse President Roosevelt and his administration of big business alliance with city government, standard oil company monopolies, social injustice towards blacks, abuses of child labor. Uh, there's a report that comes out that says 70 of the, I'm sorry, 75 of the 90 senators somehow are getting money from the railroad companies. Huh, thank goodness in 2021 we've solved that problem about senators taking money from, you know, businesses. Now I got Neil Diamond stuck in my head. It's Mr. Stidham, he's driving me crazy. All right, progressives. So here are three interesting progressive uh, policies. You have initiative. So initiative is when the people, not the legislative, but the people of a state can write their own law. And if, if enough of them sign the petition, then that can be voted on. And so there you go. So if you want to change the state meal of Oklahoma from uh, country fried uh, steak and country fried, yeah, country fried steak and, and uh, fried okra. If you want to get rid of that and you want to change it to pizza, if you get enough people to sign that petition, we can have a vote on it. So that's a petition. Or to change the Oklahoma National, or the, I'm sorry, the Oklahoma State Musical Instrument. Do you know it? The Oklahoma State Musical Instrument? I'll give you a second. 
Referendum. A referendum, the people could veto a piece of legislation put into effect. So it's the opposite. If, if enough of us got together, then we could vote the, and get enough of us to sign a piece of paper that says we're going to do it. We could put a vote out to undo a piece of legislation that we thought the legislature was awful with. Fiddle. Fiddle is the answer. Uh, the state colors. That's your next question. Recall. People can remove a government official. So uh, if, we, if we elect somebody and or somebody's appointed and we decide, hey, you know what, we made a mistake and we get enough people on the signatures and then we can put up a vote and we can pull somebody out of office. Green and white. There you go. All right. The 17, and so those are all progressive ideas and our state uh, has all of those all of those uh, we have the ability to do that not all the states in the United States have that ability but we have that ability in Oklahoma because <laughs> if you learned Oklahoma history we're a pretty progressive state the 17th amendment was passed by Congress allowing for the direct election of United States senators so before this we voted for our legislators our state legislators and the state legislators elected or uh, voted for the senators the federal senators and now we just do it as a group of uh, the, the, the citizens. Note, Oklahoma, one of the more progressive states, has used these three progressive strategies throughout its history. For example, paramutual betting. That's why we have Remington Park. That was a initiative. Liquor by the drink. You can now go into a bar and buy a glass of alcohol instead of a bottle of alcohol. And then teacher raises was the last big one that came up. We had enough people who said, you know what, teachers, <laughs> they're not getting paid enough to listen to their buddies walk up into the hall singing karaoke with Neil Diamond. They're not getting paid enough. We're coming to America. That's what he was singing. Right, no, no. <laughs> Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. The club movement, women's club, women's clubs like the Women's Trade Union and the National Consumers League, they're going to start to mobilize, mobilize uh, female uh, consumers to pressure legislators to, to do stuff, to uh, pass female-friendly legislation. Plus, we're getting closer and closer. We're getting closer and closer to the ability of females to actually vote for the President of the United States. <laughs> Uh, we're getting there. We're getting close. In 1905, in 19, I have these backwards for whatever reason. In 1905, Lochner versus the United States of America, U.S. Lochner versus U.S. This is so wrong. Lochner versus New York in 1905. The case uh, dealt with a baker who wanted to uh, bake for longer than 10 hours, but the uh, but New York said, no, nope, baker's hours are going to be 10 hours a day maximum, 10 hours a day. And so uh, Lochner sued and said, no, I want to work more than that. Uh, you can't stop me from working more than hours than I want to work. Um, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, one of the justices on the Supreme Court, he uh, he wrote in his decision that the right to make a contract um, allows us to work as long as we want to work. So if somebody wants to work 14 hours or someone wants to work 16 hours a day, good for you. Now you have to get your boss to agree to that and or the boss has to get their employees to agree to that. But if you both agree to work 14 hour days, then uh, then you're allowed to do that. That's what, and so, so the Supreme Court ruled on that. Okay, so that seems like that's, that makes sense. Then, in 1908, we have Mueller versus Oregon. There's an extra E in there. I may have misspelled that. Anyway, Mueller versus Oregon in 1908. Um, it came up and said, okay, but for women, we can make an exception of the rule that says you can't set a number of, of uh, a, a limit of hours. For women, you can set a limit of hours. That's our Supreme Court said that. Um, and so the, the rationale was that 
this is the Supreme Court talking, not Dr. Jones, that obviously women are, you know, the inferior when it comes to their physical ability. Um, they have to not only worry about what they're doing at the house or what they're doing at work, but they got to worry about their kids, you know, and raising the kids and, you know, sweeping and vacuuming and doing the dishes. Not Dr. Jones, as the Supreme Court said. And so, therefore, it's okay um, for federal jobs that, uh, that, they can, that they can specifically say, women, you can only work eight hours a day. Some of you are like, but didn't, I mean, isn't there like a rule in the Constitution that says you can't select a specific group of people that all laws have to apply to everybody equally? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's in there in the 14th Amendment. Yeah, it's, you know, something about all citizens being treated equal. Oh, some citizens can't vote yet, so you just can't wait to take U.S. government, AP government, right? <laughs> the square deal. All right, so the square deal. Roosevelt's going to go after, let's see, control the corporations, consumer protection, and conservation. So he's going to be our conservation president. He's going to be the one who's going to establish a lot of national parks. Uh, let's see, Roosevelt threatened Pennsylvania mine operator George Bear with federal troops uh, because uh, the mine, uh, the miners are going to, let's see, let's see, Fet, uh, tr uh, about, threaten them with federal troops as scab miners if striking workers were not given a 10% raise and reduce the hours of working. So here we have a president who says, Fine, you know what? If you're not going to pay your if you're not going to pay your people, I'm going to have the army come in and we're going to take over the mine. Uh, okay, that's that, that's you know no, <laughs> that's for the for George Blair. That's not a good I idea. Congress created the Department of Commerce in 1903 and is going to provide oversight to interstate commerce. If you cross the line, it's a federal issue. If you cross the line, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, railroads. President Roosevelt and railroads, <laughs> they did not get along. Here you have a cartoon of him wrestling. He's wrestling a railroad. And here he's up here walking softly with his big stick. He's about to thump a railroad company. Roosevelt goes after the Northern Securities Company and Railroad Trust that monopolized the Northwest. And so Supreme Court agrees with Roosevelt and says, hey, you've got to break up into smaller, business, smaller railroads. Not one giant railroad, you got to break up into small railroad companies. In 1903, Elkins Act railroads could not give rebates to only certain groups. Yeah, we just covered that. You can't, that, that's against, you can't do that. You can't be like, hey, 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 I like you, you get a 10% discount. I don't like you, you have to pay full price. In fact, you have to pay double. You can't, can't do that. You're not, no, mm -mm. <laughs> Thank goodness we don't do that in the year 2021 anymore. Is that a cricket? I thought I heard a cricket. There's not actually a cricket. I was trying to do that. It was dramatic. Okay. In 1906, Hepburn. <laughs> I cracked myself up. We're coming to America today. Neil Simon. 1906, Hepburn Act. Uh, railroads could not give free pass, free passes to only certain groups. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, in your readings, I think this coming up week, you, you have a, uh, a selection from The Jungle written by Upton Sinclair. Hopefully at some point you're going to be asked to read that novel. It's not too terribly long. Uh, Upton Sinclair is uh, he's kind of pushing uh, a bit of a socialist agenda here. Uh, and so what he's doing is he's trying to point out the, uh, the unfair and often dangerous working conditions in some of these uh, factories. And in the jungle, he focuses on the meat packing industry. So when he writes this book, he, he's pretty descriptive. And ultimately, I mean, I think his goal was he wanted to point out the dangerous, the danger, the danger of working in these jobs and that we need to have, you know, some sort of oversight committee to come in and say, now, wait a second, you can't treat your people like this. But a lot of people read the book and said, wait. That's how, that's how hot dogs are made? That's how hot dogs are made? Um, and they started to freak out. And so 
<laughs> at first, Roosevelt, uh, his response to the, to the jungle was, eh, you know, that's how hot dogs are made. I mean, I mean, he's a manly man. He, he goes out and he shoots his own bears. I mean, that, there you go. So, uh, but there's a lot of political pressure on him to, uh, <laughs> to go, okay, we actually probably do need to look at the processes. So in 1906, the Meat, Inspe <laughs> the Meat Inspection Act 1906 was passed. Roosevelt signed that into law. So uh, the United States, the USDA, the USDA, the United States, uh, the people that stamp the food that makes it okay, the USDA, what does it stand for? Somebody look that up real quick, the USDA. Anyway, the USDA is formed, and so the USDA says, we're going to look at your cows four times, basically. We're going to look at them uh, when they're out there in the field, make sure that they're all healthy and, you know, all, all, you know, they're not, you know, not looking like a cow. We're going to look at them after you kill them to make sure that, one, it's humane, and two, there's not, you know, like green stuff coming out of one of the ends that shouldn't be there. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at your actual meat processing factories um, and make sure that they are reasonably clean and that you are following clean procedures with regarding to getting all that stuff into the hot dog. <laughs> and then the fourth time they're going to do random inspections by opening up hot dogs or whatever and they're going to look in there and go, hmm, this has extra chewy stuff, which is never good for hot dogs. So that was the Food and, uh, Meat Inspection Act of 1906. You got this political cartoon over here, and you've got uh, President Roosevelt, and he's uh, <laughs> the meat scandal, and he's the investigation. So here we have down here in this uh, cartoon, it says uh, in Chicago, the cans as ham, ham and tongue, ham, and you've got little squirrels popping out of there. Uh, Woo, good times. Uh, one of the things that was passed in the 1906 uh, Meat Inspection Act. United States, U.S. Um, said that everything on the label had to be true. Everything on the label had to be true. So you couldn't be like, hey, Coca-Cola is good for you. I mean, back then, let's see, did they, have, did they still have cocaine in Coca-Cola in 1906? Eh, probably not. I think they, they phased that out. I say that, I'm not for sure. But, uh, uh, you had to put you had to put the ingredients on the uh, on the side of the can. Now, note you didn't have to put all the ingredients inside of the can, but you did have to put true ingredients on the side of the can. Uh, moving on. I could stop right here, run over to Sonic, get a chili cheese foot <laughs> chili cheese foot long hot dog. Mustard and onions. Welcome to the... Rose, uh, okay, Earth Control. Yellowstone National Park. Anybody been to Yellowstone? Make sure you get there before it explodes. Roosevelt, the, the consummate natural, naturalist and rancher, pushed for conservation acts. We know this one? Do we know this? Do we know this? Do you know that monument? That's the first U.S. monument, natural monument. Um, first park. First monument. Anybody know that one? That's Devil's Tower. That's Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Uh, and so if you have a bunch of mashed potatoes on your plate, you can take a fork and you can kind of, you can design your own Devil's Tower with mashed potatoes. And there's like two of you who are like, oh yeah, I saw that movie. In 1902, New Ones Act authorized government to use funds from Western land sales to develop irrigation projects. Okay, irrigation, that's important. Roosevelt sets aside 125 million acres for federal reserves and national parks. That's okay, that's important, that's good. And then Roosevelt, Roosevelt was always pushing for, hey, make sure everything's sustainable. So if you clear cut some trees, plant more trees so that, you know, later we can clear cut the trees again, that kind of stuff. Panic for 1907. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Roosevelt became president in 1901 because of the assassination of McKinley. He's going to run again in 1904, and he's going to win easily. Uh, and then 
So when he when he wins, he's like, okay, I'm only gonna go four more years. I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do this again. So just throwing that out there. Panic of 1907 was was a short little deal, but what's important about the Panic of 1907 is that the Federal Reserve System, um, people are messing with money and uh, inflation this and inflation that and the devaluation of the dollar here and the up valuation. No, the evaluation of the dollar. And then somebody said, you know, we should really have a government agency that actually, you know, decides how much a dollar's really worth. And the Federal Reserve Board was created. Ah, uh, some of you know that. Good for you. Our next president in line, 1908, Taft. Taft ran against, uh, yeah, William, William Jennings Bryan. This guy, he doesn't know when to quit. <laughs> kind of feel sorry for him. I really don't. Um, because he's going to be important here in like two two videos, three videos. He's we're talking about the Scopes Monkey Trial. It's going to be fun. Wins the election at uh, William H. Taft. Uh, the, the largest of our presidents. He's a big guy. According to Wikipedia that I looked at right before I, I did this uh, slideshow here. Um, he weighed somewhere between 325 and 350 pounds at the end of his presidency. And, of course, the most famous anecdotal story is that he got stuck in the bathtub because he was... Uh, okay. Whether that actually happened or not, but it's kind of fun. And, you know, since it's part of Americana, you know, folklore of Americana, I feel good about telling you that, whether it's true or not. So I'm just going to say, anecdotally, he got stuck in a back bathtub. Uh, Reorganize the... Okay, let's see. Okay. William Taft. Don't worry, we're going to get back to Roosevelt. He hasn't gone anywhere. Recognize the State Department, uh, reorganize the State Departments in the Far East, Latin America, and the European spheres. So, who is he missing? Who is he missing? Reorganize the State Department. So, we're talking about the people that go out and, di you know, diplomacy. Reorganize the State Department into the Far East, China, Japan, Latin America, from Mexico south. And the Europeans. Is he missing anybody? You know, like... 50-some-odd... <laughs> 50-some-odd countries, you know, south of the Mediterranean Sea. Ah, I wonder why he's not... He's neglecting Africa. Let's keep reading, shall we? Wished to reduce the tariffs, but was not greatly successful, because he wasn't... He wasn't Roosevelt... Tended towards conservative wing of the Republican Party, so he he went a little right. He started going right, and Teddy Roosevelt was Republican Party, but he was more central in the Republican Party. Let's see. Pushed for China to be the more important trading party partner. Tried 70, 70 antitrust cases in four years. We'll do that here in a second. Your last line: removed African Americans from office in the South so as to remove possible problems. Removed African Americans from office to, to proactively get rid of problems that may occur because African Americans are in office in the South. Hmm. I mean, you know, he, he doesn't have a, a department, a state department in Africa. <laughs> uh, what would we call that today? <coughs> Racist. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's see. Taft the Trust Buster. <laughs> it's kind of a cool little political cartoon. He's sitting back there and he's singing, oh, say, can you see? He's playing piano, but as he pushes, like, the, the F-sharp key, then there's a little tack and it pushes down into one of these pigs, and, he, and so the pig squeaks or oinks or whatever pigs do. And you see it says, oh, ow, oof, ouch, wee. The one on the far, the far one goes, kai-yai, kai I've never heard a pig do that, but uh, let's see. The lumber trust, the elevator combine, the sugar trust, the meat trust, the coal trust. The coal trust, that's the black kid, the black pig. Railroad combine and the oil trust. And so he's pushing the buttons and he's getting these piggies to scream. The Supreme Court of the United States rules this. This is important. You paying attention? Right, here we go. The rule of reason doctrine says a trust is only illegal. All right, so let's stop. A trust. 
A trust, generally what people think of is, a, is when one company owns like all of it, right? It's like a monopoly. So they own a whole bunch of railroads so they can inflate the prices. Or they own all of the oil companies or all, all these different pigs. Um, so that's a trust. Supreme Court says, yeah, trusts aren't necessarily bad. Trusts are only illegal if you can show that the trust intentionally restrains open trade. So a trust can only be broken up if you can prove that they are intentionally um, gouging people, if they are, that they are intentionally um, keeping other companies from coming into the market. So, for example, uh, famously we had uh, uh, Bell Telephone. So Bell Telephone uh, was huge. It was like we had all the, the Bell the Bell Company um, owned like I don't know ninety percent, ninety five percent of all the telephone lines in the United States of America, and they could charge whatever they wanted because nobody else was competing with them. So then Supreme Court ruled, nope, 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 you can't do that. And so they broke them up into, what, five different companies. And so that's why we have Southwestern Bell is one of those companies, uh, and AT&T, Verizon, uh, but uh, so that we call those the baby bells, by the way. Uh, so, but they were showing that the, the company was gouging them. So if we, take, if we take a current example, in the year 2021, and we say, I'm going to throw out a hypo, hypothetical company, uh, Amazon. So is there anybody competing with Amazon? One. If they are competing with Amazon, is Amazon intentionally stopping them from comp trying to compete? Is Amazon gouging people? Is Amazon in... Okay, so if, that, if that's all true, then Amazon, according to Supreme Court, needs to be broken up. If Amazon can, can show, no, we're allowing the little people to, you know, to try to compete with us. Or if Microsoft says, oh, no, we're allow, uh, we're, we allow Apple to, you know, they, they have computers, we have computers. <laughs> we, had a big, we had a big thing back in the 90s, the early 2000s. Every desktop that was bought that was a uh, non-Apple computer, it had Windows on it, right? Windows. And people were like, well, that's not fair. You can't. The Linux company and the Apple company are like, no, that's not fair because when people you know, turn on their brand new computer, it pops up as Windows. So already Microsoft is getting their, getting their business. That's not fair. And Microsoft argued, um, well, you can, have your, you can have your own machines. And so... Bill Gates had to argue in front of the Supreme Court. It's kind of interesting. Nah, you know what? We're going to get to that later. I got uh, two more slides. Two more slides, we're done. In 1912, President Roosevelt, I'm sorry, former President Roosevelt said, you know what, Taft, you're not doing a very good job, dude. I'm going to run for president against you. And Taft's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, we're both Republicans. So we have to, we have to get the Republican nomination. So Roosevelt ran against Taft, Roosevelt, Taft's mentor, basically, ran against Taft in the Republican nomination. And Taft won by just a couple of votes, which really irritated uh, Roosevelt. So Roosevelt said, you know what, forget that, I'm forming my own political party, the Progressive Party, and I'm forming my own pol political party, and I'm, I'm going to run for president. So there were two Republicans running for president and one Democrat running for president. All right, and so the Democrats put out, <laughs> not William Jennings Bryan, although ironically, he probably could have won this one. <laughs> but they put out a guy by the name of uh, Woodrow Wilson. We'll get to him later. Uh, not this, not this video, but uh, uh, there you go. So the two Republicans ran uh, against the one Democrat, and we saw in the Lincoln, in the Lincoln uh, election that we had what three Democrats running, well, two and a half Democrats running against Lincoln, and uh, they split the vote, and then Lincoln had got all of the Republican votes, and so 
ta-da, Lincoln became president. Same thing is going to happen here. Uh, Taft and Roosevelt are going to split the Republicans, are going to split the conservative votes, and uh, the Democrats are going to win, and which, uh, what, is, what is he going to do? <laughs> All right, got World War I coming. La, la, la. Here's a funny story to end on. Note, we have in the political cartoon, we've got uh, drinking water, but back here we've got the an elephant. Oh, no, up here. I can't see in my little... Elephant and donkey. The elephant's got a, kind of like a bandage over his eye. Elephant and donkey. And the elephant and the donkey say, uh, Severin snakes! How Theodore has changed. And you've got Theodore in his traditional glasses and his big old... Uh, smile and his big old mustache and he's a bull moose he's a bull moose and uh, why did the why, why did the political cartoon people think that that would be a cool animal for Theodore Roosevelt uh, let me tell you so here's the story uh, president uh, well my former president Roosevelt he's gonna run on the on the ticket the progressive ticket story says he was uh, he was out there in the middle of nowhere uh, what state was that oh does it tell me Milwaukee. He's got toast in the middle of nowhere. Um, and he's giving a speech and he gets up on the platform and as he's about ready as he's about ready to talk, some guy from the from the crowd shoots him, like shoots him in the chest. Roosevelt shoots him in the chest. People surround the guy and they're about to, you know, drop the hammer on him. And Roosevelt says, no, 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 he, leave him alone, he's fine, you can arrest him, but don't hurt him, I'm okay. Yeah, he just got, sh <laughs> he just got shot. Um, the bullet hit his eyeglass case in his pocket, and a, uh, a speech that he, that he had in his pocket, which was, uh, was it 50 sheets of paper that he kind of stuffed, you know, folded over and put it in his pocket? So his eyeglass case and 50 sheets of paper, it went through both of those and then got stuck in his, in his pectoral muscle. So, Ro so Roosevelt shot on stage and he goes, huh, I've just been shot. But, or actually he says something to the fact of, uh, some of you don't know this right now, but uh, I've just been shot. And the paraphrase, he says, but you know what? Nothing can stop a bull moose. So let me finish my speech. And he talks for 90 more minutes. I, guys, I'm not making this up. He talks for 90 minutes. And then after the speech is over, I mean, he's bleeding, like he's bleeding. And after the speech is over, he's like, all right, let's go to the hospital. <laughs> so they take him to the hospital. And there you go. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, he, uh, the bullet lodges in his muscle. It doesn't go into his lungs. And Roosevelt actually, because you know he he's a hunter, he knows how that works. If the bullet had perforated his muscle and gone into his lungs, he would be coughing up blood, and that would be that would be bad. But no, it just stuck stuck in his muscle and uh, manly, right? And uh, there you go. So attempted assassination, not not successful, and uh, for the rest of his life, Roosevelt carried that bullet in his muscle because. The doctor said, eh, it'd probably be, it's probably more of a pain to take it out than just to leave it in. So there you go. All right. Next week, we've got a Democrat for president for the first time in a long time, uh, President Woodrow Wilson. And we're going about to get ourselves in the middle of Europe's business. Something about World War I. All right. You know the drill. Be good. I'll see you, see you in a little bit.